Hello! Welcome to another episode of Ancient Office Hours by the Ozymandias Project. Trireme Transit is now boarding for all new and returning passengers. Now departing, present ponderings. Next stop is Ancient Office Hours at a library lost in the sands of time. Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 50 of Ancient Office Hours. This week, I was joined by the delightful Dr. Victoria Austin, a new postdoctoral fellow at Carleton College. However, at the time of this recording, Dr. Austin was just finishing a multi-year stint at the University of Winnipeg. Her research focuses primarily on the intersection of literature and material culture in the analysis of Roman gardens and landscapes of the mind. More broadly, she is interested in Latin literature, especially from the late Republic and early Empire, Roman history and material culture, race and ethnicity in the ancient and modern world, and the reception of classics in modern media. She has taught classes covering a wide range of topics, from Latin literature to the reception of the ancient world through film, as well as mythology, history, and visual and material culture. We discussed her decision to drop Latin before pursuing a degree in classics, her interest in literary gardens and liminal spaces rather than physical ones, and her thoughts on statues and the meaning of monumentality. I hope you enjoy this episode, and if you like what you hear, please give us a five-star rating and review us on Apple or Spotify. You can also subscribe to our Patreon, as this will allow us to reach more people and make more exciting ancient world content. Enjoy! So thank you for joining me this evening, morning, whatever time is a afternoon, (laughs) whatever it is. I don't even know what it is, but thank you for joining me. So I just want to get the ball rolling and like head right into the big, exciting. How did you get into classics? How did you discover your love for this like really old ancient thing that's like super nerdy and awesome? Yeah. So I was thinking about this in preparation for our recording and I, I realized that in some ways, my journey into classics is very traditional. And then other parts of it are really weird and wacky. And I've gone off in my own kind of way. But but in terms of the the very beginning of my journey, I was very lucky. I went to a school in the UK from the age of 12. So our senior school where they offered Latin from 12. Very, very traditional kind of, um, you know, girls school in the UK, all of, all of that kind of stuff. And, and they offered Latin and I had never never even thought about it before it had never really entered my sphere it was just one of those things like all the subjects when you're 12 you just you have to take it and you don't really have any choice in it I I kind of continued on between I guess when I was 12 to 15 ish and then in the UK you have this set of exams when you're 16 called GCSEs where you get to pick a certain certain amount of topics that you so you kind of limit down your subjects and at the time obviously being 16 I thought I am far too cool to to be taking Latin GCSE so even though I was really really good at it and my teachers were very very disappointed that I didn't want to take it for GCSEs I I did actually drop it at that point because I as I said I thought you know too cool for for Latin I guess at that point my journey becomes a bit paused and then the next two years at school I took classical civilization so that's when I looked at the texts but in translation and I think I took that class because I really liked English literature and I really liked history and for me it kind of combined those two elements and then you know, about six months into taking class civ, I thought I've probably made a bit of a mistake here dropping <laughs> dropping Latin. So then I thought, you know, there's time to, to get back on this path. And I applied to do classical civilization at university then, picked up Latin and the Greek again at university level. And then, then it takes more of the traditional route in that back on the traditional track and I did my BA and then I did an MA and then I did a PhD. So a few bumps in the road, I suppose. And yeah, I think that initial love that I came across when doing classical civilization of that combination between the literature and the history, that was just something that really struck me as so fascinating because I always loved reading as a child. I was an avid reader 
always would take a million books on on vacation you know when when you didn't have a kindle or a reader you know my suitcase would be half full of books to take and I'd go through one a day and um, but then I also really really loved history and so that's why when I was reading the Odyssey and we also did some Greek tragedies during classical civilization but in translation I got to think about oh, well, how does culture kind of apply to these texts and what's going into the creation of these texts, the history? And it was then that I really realized that I, I loved that intersection and classics for me. That's what makes it so exciting because it has so many sub journeys and topics within it. And we get to combine those in really interesting ways. That's a great, great path. I love how you decided that you didn't need that Latin. Yeah. Um, that's, that's kind of fantastic. I know. I know. Everyone always says, oh, but didn't you drop Latin at school? And I have to say, yes. You know, it was a it was a moment where I look back and I think, oh, the shame. Because obviously I then undoubtedly made it a bit more difficult for myself because then when you're doing a university level, everything is much more condensed time-wise, you're learning it much more intensively. Whereas if you start at 12, it's a much more slow meandering process, which I think it is very nice in, in many ways. But I, I always had that foundational three years of the beginners that I think really put me in good stead to then transition into the really intensive stuff at university level but yeah I kind of I look back at that and I and I think oh should I regret it but then in the end it all worked out so I guess that's how it goes no it definitely worked out yeah you know it was kind of an annoyance but you know yeah. you were able to just go and and then pick up Latin anyway and like any language if you have a basis for it, you kind of remember and then you're like okay it exactly. clicks back in a place. yeah and I think so many people now start Latin and Greek at the university level that really it would have just been an advantage to having done it you know from from the age of 12 so I think in in that sense it's becoming unfortunately increasingly less common to learn it from a young age so I, I'm very very glad when I look back that I had that chance to learn it and experience it at a young age and and to not have to be kind of thrown into this new but ancient language and, and have to deal with it so intensely because you know that is that is one of the challenges when you go to university that it can seem very overwhelming I think for students that you know you're, you're running through an entire textbook in one semester whereas I probably did it over two years at school so it's a very very different approach yeah well so I mean the language is great to have it from so young but sort of language aside though I know you said you love history was it specifically though like with the ancient Greeks and Romans or being from the UK with a, a billion really cool ancient sites there um, unlike in the US like did you also have a fascination and were you able to travel to any of the sites in the UK you know Again, very strangely, everyone assumes that I must have been to all of these Roman sites in the UK. I have been to Bath and seen the Roman baths, but I have never been to Hadrian's Wall, for example, even though, you know, it's really not that far from where I grew up. Um, but it's so again, I have the, this weird mix of the traditional and non-traditional journey because yeah, I, I don't remember ever being specifically interested in, oh, I really love the Greeks, I really love the Romans. As I said, it was this, it was more um, how the subject comes together as a subject that really interested me. Like I said, this intersection between the literature and the material culture and the history. And I was like, wow, I can do a deep dive into all of these things on one specific period and I don't have to give up the literature or the history I, I get to do it all so for me I think that's what was the selling point okay no that's pretty cool yeah. I will say the only reason I've been to Hadrian's Wall is because I decided somewhere in my deep self-conscious that I thought it would be an amazing idea to do a semester abroad at the University of Edinburgh. And then someone was like, come on, you have to go see Hadrian's Wall. And I was like, but do I? Yeah, I do. So I went and saw it. But that's the only reason. Yeah, no, totally. And, and like you said, it's um, so amazing that in the UK, we do have all of these sites kind of right at our fingertips. And, and I think 
being from the UK, you do fall into that trap of taking that history as much. We take it for granted, definitely, because you're surrounded by it. And then when I moved to North America, it didn't really dawn on me until I was experiencing the opposite, where I was suddenly faced with everything is so new here. And, and the reference point for what is old in North America is just so vastly different. That that took a while. I think that was a that was a definite cultural shift to get used to. <laughs> no, it's so funny. Yeah, I have a, a really close friend of mine who's uh, from Shropshire. She grew up uh, on, in a little town bordering England and Wales. Yeah, I think I was telling her about something that I was like, yeah, it's really old for the US. And she was just so totally unimpressed because she just yeah. kind of gave me, she made a face and was like, okay, my grandfather's house is like 600 years old. So nothing yeah. you're about to say is old. And I was like, yeah. oh, okay, never mind. I'll go like hide in my corner now. Yeah, I remember when I first moved to Canada and there was this item on the news and they said, you know, about preserving one of the oldest houses in the in the city. And I was thinking, wow, how old? How old is this? And it was like 1910 or something. And I had just moved from a house in the UK that was built in the 1890s. And that was just one of hundreds and hundreds of houses. You know, there's nothing special about it. And then I moved and suddenly 1910 was the oldest building in the city. And I just, yeah, it was it's very different. <laughs> It's yeah, it's a bit of a shock. So and and this is something that I kind of wonder, I mean, because it's I don't know why, but maybe it's because of the UK's Roman past. But I'm always really curious by it seems to me that like I've noticed a lot of British classicists, they become Latinists. And I'm like, OK, is it because like you were in a country where you just like the Romans are there or like, you know, like, why am I not finding more Hellenists? I mean, Based on my own experience, I think it could potentially be linked to the fact that, although not as common as maybe I would like it to be, Latin as a language is offered, you know, in comparison to ancient Greek, it's offered at a school level. Uh, and it was traditionally part of the curriculum. My, my dad, I remember, he, he remembers nothing about learning Latin, except for he can still do the amo, amas, mat, and that. And, you know, there's so many people in the UK that when you say, oh, I study Latin, or an old generation, they can still recite those, <laughs> those classic verbs to you. And so I think because Latin has that link to the traditional educational system in a way that ancient Greek does not, Whereas I think ancient Greek, traditionally, you wouldn't start it until the university level. It, it's much more rare, even in comparison to the rarity of, of Latin, to do Greek as a teenager, for example. So I think most people are maybe like me, that you start with Latin and then Greek becomes the thing that you have to pick up a bit later on. And so I just have an affinity for Latin in a way that maybe I didn't for ancient Greek. So just a uh, no, an outcome of the of the training, the the way it works. I think. I mean, that I, that's definitely the way I saw it. I was always, oh, I've done Latin for ages. I'm comfortable with this, and then suddenly, oh, now I have to do Greek. And then, so <laughs> it's just, yeah, I've always always swayed towards the Latin side, but um, I'd never thought about it in terms of a country wide trend. But now you now you say that, I think a lot of British classes there is a dominant kind of Latinist tradition I think in the UK in comparison to North America where most of my friends actually are Hellenist so I'm more the odd one out <laughs> yeah no I don't know why but it just it, it occurred the thought occurred to me because yeah all my friends and myself included we were all like yeah yeah Romans okay interesting okay where are the Greeks where are the Greeks where are the Greeks yeah it's weird, right? Like, yeah, I wonder whether also it, it comes into, I know the Iliad and the Odyssey become part of this canon of the, the so-called great books courses that they have at universities in North America, as opposed to you wouldn't have that kind of course in the UK because of the way you, you know, the university systems work very differently in the way you accumulate credits, et cetera, is very different. So the starting point for a lot of people's access in North America, I think, tends to be more with 
the Odyssey and the Iliad and then also Greek myth as well. Whereas I think in the UK, you're coming from this, oh, I took Latin at school and now I, I see that as my entry point into classics. So perhaps that is part of this, this divide. Maybe. I mean, I'd be interested to, to know if anyone might have just vaguely observed a pattern, maybe did a yeah. little research, put together some statistics. Yeah, that would be that would be really interesting, actually. You know, where where is the divide? Are, are you North Americans? Are you more Hellenists? And, and we're, we're the staunch Latinists. I don't know what the answer to that is. Well, if anyone's doing that research, please reach out. Please let us know. I'm that very curious. Really about fascinating, this. actually, to see where yeah. the divide is. Yeah. Yeah, because then you can add in like where do like Australian and mm. Kiwi classicists factor in? Like, yeah. what do they study? Yeah, I think e- each country has their own kind of scholarly vibe to it, but I've never yeah. thought about it in in that kind of division. So, it'd be very interesting to find out. Just you know, random thoughts that I randomly yeah. have. <laughs> But so when choosing your actual area of uh, expertise, how did you settle on, I saw it was like really cool. What is it like landscape archaeology or architecture? Yeah, so um, my, my PhD thesis and I recently just as in last week submitted the final manuscript for my monograph uh, which was a redo of my thesis is on Roman gardens but Roman gardens more in the I suppose the imaginary space so literary gardens and gardens as depicted in art and sculpture that kind of thing as opposed to I'm not an archaeologist by training so when I say Roman gardens people think oh you're an archaeologist and I have to be like no 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 (laughs) but purely more kind of theoretical gardens (laughs) but I I came to gardens through a, a broader interest I suppose in the way in which different spaces were explored in literature so during my MA in particular I got really interested in this idea of the space and the city. And I did my MA thesis on a series of Marshall's epigrams, looking at the journey of the poet and his book through the city and what that tells us about social hierarchies and all of these various things. And from that, I thought, oh, I really want to think more about other types of spaces and how they're expressed in literature and art and and what that means for the Romans. And initially gardens were going to be, as with all PhD projects, gardens were going to be maybe one chapter or half a chapter. And then suddenly you realize that, wow, there's so much material on this thing. And so that then became my sole focus. And yeah, I've just loved exploring. I kind of take a very case study approach and my book has six different case studies. And I look at different either literary descriptions of gardens or artistic depictions of them and think about how the Romans viewed those spaces and what they what they mean to them and how they utilize them. Wow, that's really cool. Because I think definitely that just took off in a way where most people would not accept. Oh, yes, I study gardens. Yeah. But in the minds. Yeah. (laughs) And I think people come and are expecting like, can you show me around this garden and just like talk to me about this and this and this. Yeah. You see, that is how I'm going to explain it from now on. Gardens of the mind. <laughs> That's a, ah, but no, gardens of the mind. Yes. Uh, I, I regularly have to maybe disappoint some people that I'm not, in fact, an archaeologist. And they'll ask me these really archaeological questions. And I have to, you know, point them in the direction of fantastic other scholars that are doing that archaeological work on gardens. And I, I utilize their work as a kind of real life comparison. But I suppose, yeah, I'm more interested in, yes, there's this real space, but then when you use the concept of that real space to kind of create a literary text or a depiction on a wall, or why are you using that space to explore a certain topic? And I'm very interested in all of these various divisions that we find in the garden. So, you know, art and nature or real and imagined, I look at a lot sacred profane and and we see a lot with gardens that their their spaces they're very liminal spaces so they're spaces that activities occur in or they're the setting in a piece of literature where boundaries are being pushed a lot and people are trying to 
blur the, these distinctions that the Romans love to set up these, oh yes, very finite distinctions and we have this order, but then they automatically undermine those <laughs> once they set them up. And there's this really interesting play in all of these supposed oppositions that go on in these spaces. And so that, that's really what I look at in, in my book, in particular, this idea that, well, you manufacture this idea of these oppositions in the creation of your garden, but then why are you then undermining them? And what does that tell us about what you're trying to do and what your political ideology is or your social mores and all of these kind of things? So there's lots to be said, I think, about gardens and, and landscapes more broadly. No, it's so cool because, I mean, I think when you just said like liminal spaces, it's interesting. Maybe it's because of the training that that I've had or just I don't even know what it is. But when I think of liminal spaces, you know, I'm thinking like the Egyptian sort of like life and death, the yeah. place between, you know, my mind does not jump to garden. So so it's quite interesting how you were able to sort of focus and find an interest here in, in sort of, a as I said, the garden of the mind when yeah. it's so easy to to take like a liminal space and you could literally apply that to could be the afterlife that's sort of a liminal space you know yeah. culture so it's interesting how you definitely picture the, the the more landscape yeah and it's really interesting that your first thought was the afterlife and life and death because the romans regularly had tomb gardens as well and so they they would regularly surround or include some kind of planted space or, or a collection of flowers and you know at what point does that become a garden is a, is a whole other question that I think about but there's there's often this connection that they draw between kind of garden and green spaces and sacred spaces or tomb spaces and you see that a lot of tomb spaces they have there are inscriptions that say yes I want you to maintain this tomb and look after it and you should also look after the garden as well and there's instructions there's this great example of an inscription where it's directing well how many gardeners is maybe needed to maintain this space and you know you should you should dedicate this amount of time per year and it's probably going to cost you this much and you should don't just look at the physical tomb, but you have to maintain that green space around it as well. So it's very much seen as part of that tomb structure. So the liminality, and I suppose this idea of rebirth and the cycles of life that you get with plants, it all aligns very nicely with these tomb gardens. Interesting. And and since they're not physical, so, so since you're not like literally walking around in physical gardens being like, oh, yes, and this architecture <laughs> here is very Roman. So I'm trying to think like, you know, sort of in like modern culture, like, do we have anything that really sort of is similar? I'm trying to think like, I guess my first thought of sort of like, yes, it's a physical garden, but it, it, it does play like a, a role in the mind as well. It's like the White House uh, Rose Garden or the Kitchen Garden that I don't even remember which first lady started it. But I think like, it was Michelle Obama that started the Kitchen Garden, yeah. Okay, see, because I, I was like, because we think, because it's like a physical garden, but like it's also transformed into like the minds of people because they just know there's like a garden that yeah, is there. That's actually so. a really great comparison because there's obviously the physicality of the space and you can enjoy moving through it. You pointed to something that I basically try and uncover about the Romans that yes Michelle Obama created this vegetable garden and it's a garden but there's a lot of kind of political and social issues like you know why a vegetable garden at this particular time and then what it means to be associated with the Obamas versus then what what types of trees and plants did other first ladies plant and, and you kind of compare all of those things and basically what I try and do with you know literary gardens or artistic depictions and even even in terms of real plantings that we do have some evidence for of Roman gardens it's uncovering or rediscovering the meaning behind them so well why did they plant them in this way because there's always there's always a meaning behind it, whether it's purely aesthetic or whether there's something else going on. And I mean, a lot of my research suggests that there is a lot more going on than just aesthetics and, you know, why certain plants are used at certain times by certain people. I do a lot of work on the Augustan period and his use of kind of botanical arboreal symbols 
to promote various parts of his dynastic <laughs> glory and, and all of the associations that he wants to draw out about this new government. And he really uses the kind of power of plants to put forward a certain type of messaging. And I think it's really interesting because it's often in a very subtle way that I think you don't realize that it's contributing to the Augustan, you know, so-called message of his kind of visual communication, but it's there and it's, and it's all kind of, it's this living, breathing facet, I suppose, of his way of installing his new stamp on the city. <laughs> like, I guess, just sort of on a, on a smaller detail with like a garden detail within a garden detail. Was it more just about the garden as a whole or did like, was there more thought, was there like individual, like, plants that went in because it's like oh this plant has a special meaning so I'm going to have this flower or was it like no 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 just plants flowers whatever just but it makes up the whole yeah I mean definitely again if I think about Augustus and one of my case studies I look at his wife Livia has this the so-called garden room it's you know a 360 painted room all surrounding beautiful kind of garden depiction and you can just appreciate it from an aesthetic point of view this is a lovely painting but the minute you start to look into well what plants are depicted here you realize that they're a very specific collection of shall we call them Augustan plants you know there's an oak tree and that's linked to his Corona Civica and there's a lot of laurel because that's connected to Julius Caesar. There are various other plants that you can connect to stories that relate to his political mythos. This idea there's a palm tree, there's a famous story that you know when he arrived on this island this plant tree that had been withering away it suddenly burst and sprung to life again and so this whole you know miraculous fecundity very much ties into you know his whole social program of restoring religious mores this traditional emphasis on marriage and producing children and you see that reflected in the choice of plants that are in Livia's garden room. So I think that in, on an artistic level, I think there are many examples where the specific plant choice, particularly because this is a garden linked to an emperor, it's very, the, the choice of plants in that room painted are very, very pointed. There's definitely examples that they had this idea that certain plants represented certain things, and then that imagery could be used for various social or political messaging. And Augustus very, very much harnessed that for his own, his own political gain. And, you know, in comparison to Livia's garden room, we have the Arapakis, and, you know, a lot of people focus on the top friezes with these mythical static scenes of Romulus and Remus and this big processional scene, but the bottom section, and it wraps the whole way around, it's just all flowers and plants, and, you know, traditionally that was very much thought of in terms of, well, it's merely decorative it doesn't it doesn't mean anything it's just you know a nice bit of decoration underneath but my argument contributes to a, a shift in scholarship that basically considers the messaging of the plants just as important as the messaging of the upper freezes and and they they work together to create so it's not just kind of floral fancy on the bottom. It's like, it does actually have meaning to it. It's not purely decorative is really important, I think, with that freeze. No, that's really good to know because, uh, you know, not having really given much or any thought to that. Um, <laughs> I think my friends and I, you know, we even to this day, you know, we, we, we see any kind of thing with some plants on it. And we're like, OK, well, that's like floral and shit. OK, cool. Like, how exactly. nice. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's it's really recently, I think, and as part of more of this shift in art history to kind of reconsider what is, you know, the central bit of the art and what is maybe the, the outside or the borders or, like you said, simply kind of ornamental stuff. And flowers very regularly fall into people's conception of ornamental, you know, fluff, basically. You don't give it a second thought, but... The more I look into Roman gardens, the more I think that that just 
is far too simplistic for their the way that they use these images and you know sometimes a plant is just a plant and I'm, I'm happy to accept that sometimes it is just because it looked pretty but there are also times when it's very much used for a, a messaging purpose I think that's why now I want to know, like, because so much uh, like ancient Minoan art, you know, has, has all the, the flowers and the natural elements along with the, the animals and the people. Yeah. So I'm, I'm like, wait, so, so are those just like random flowers with the dolphins or exactly does that mean yeah. something? Can someone it tell could, me? You know, like I said, sometimes a painting is just a painting. But other times it does mean something. And, and it's part of the my job I suppose when I'm doing my research is to try and unpit which category these things fall into or whether it's too simplistic to even think about putting flowers and plants into a category in that again thinking about the garden as this liminal space that kind of undermines various boundaries I think one of the fundamental boundaries uh, and binaries that it challenges is this idea of that there's this central thing and then there's just the ornamental stuff around it. But I think they're actually in conversation with one another. And that's why I love the R Park is so much because I don't think we should separate the key messages of those, you know, big political, mythical freezes at the top from what's going on at the bottom as well, because they actually communicate and have messaging with each other that is that I think is so integral to to the reading of the entire monument I think it it does a disservice to the monument if we ignore one half of the decoration basically that's so interesting I this is making me want to take a second look at the Arapakis also because I will admit that I took an age of Augustus class so, somewhere along the way when I was that would probably that would be my favorite class to take <laughs> <laughs> oh no see as such a strong Hellenist yeah I I loved my professor she was amazing I hated the class though because I just I didn't like the Romans I did not I did not like Augustus I did my final paper well, in the entire like class Augustus, but I like teaching about him because he's very interesting <laughs> okay see that's good no my professor loved him she just loved studying him she found him to be the most fascinating she was just like let's, let's talk about Augustus Augustus this Augustus that and I was just like oh my god it was really funny I wrote my entire final paper my term paper in that class basically saying that he was a horrible horrible person who destroyed Republican Rome and <laughs> you know started the imperialistic uh, thing and you know he's just horrible and terrible and I remember she just kind of uh, made a joke out of it and was like I'm very sad. Everyone else chose <laughs> to just write about some wonderful, some aspect of, you know, his, the Augustan age. She's like, and here you are just like totally tearing into this man and his entire legacy. I'm like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I think again, the, the reason why maybe I'm so drawn to that period in particular is maybe because I journeyed into classics through the literature angle. And obviously so much of the literature that we have, you know, it's called the so-called golden age, you know, of literature for a reason. It comes out of this period. And, you know, so much, even if you look at later literature, which increasingly I am moving into more later imperial literature, but in order to fully understand that, a lot of it is in conversation with the stuff that's been produced at the time of Augustus. So I think if you're doing Latin literature and that's your love, you can't really avoid thinking about the age of Augustus in that way, because it's just so crucial and fundamental to, to so much of what's going on in literature at that time. Yeah, well... I admit, I was like, yeah, you can't get away from it, which is probably why I was like, I'm staying away. I'm being, <laughs> I'm becoming a Hellenist. I want to avoid this as much yeah. as I can. <laughs> um, I, I do have very strong feelings about the Aeneid and Aeneas though, uh, as opposed to, I think again, with the literary angle, I really do not like Aeneas as a character. <laughs> He's, I, I really love the Aeneid as a as a text but Aeneas is just the worst and any student of mine that we have somehow the Aeneid has come into a conversation I think they would all be able to say oh Dr Austin does not like Aeneas <laughs> he's, he's not a nice he's not a nice man he's not a hero because I often bring you know what does the hero mean in all of these various texts 
And I say, well, I tell you, he's not a hero. In my book, <laughs> <he is." laughs> oh man, no, that's great. No, I mean, oh, I knew we'd get along, although I don't really like the Aeneid anyway. I mean, I just call it bad Homer fanfic, but Roman. But it's too simplistic I, to think I, of it I know, it's, <laughs> like, I know it's not, but you know, I'm like, no, I don't. Well, well, to me, and then Aeneas was just like, to me, I was like, he was, he's just annoying little Roman twat is what I call it. <laughs> I think for me, he's like the least endearing part of the text. You know, you think of the Odyssey and I also have very strong feelings about Odysseus. I mean, he's also not a very good hero. <laughs> um, <laughs> Basically, all the people we think are heroes are not very heroic, from a modern perspective, at least. But I think there's there's elements of Odysseus's character that I can enjoy and I get behind and I like the stories, whereas I love the Aeneid and there's so many interesting parts of that text and what it does in Latin literature. And again, the connection to the politics of the time. But Aeneas as a figure is just, yeah, not my favorite. Not my favorite man. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> So turning a bit more to sort of contemporary yeah. representations, you know, I don't think there's any sort of film or TV show that really focuses on gardens. But but if we had to pick from what's available, you know, is there like a movie or a series where they did feature some like really nice gardens or or scenes in gardens <laughs> that you really like? You know, very weirdly, I, I suppose my my love for Roman gardens it extends out into I do a lot of work in the Pompeii region because that's where so much of our evidence from evidence is from. Now the film Pompeii with Kit Harrington is terrible <laughs> and I actually teach it as part of my ancient world through film class and we have it's one of our more light-hearted picks and we have a lot of fun kind of poking holes in the plot and you know a tsunami is stopped by the uh, brick wall and you know it's hilarious but one thing I do really love about that film is the way in which they incorporated the reality of the site of Pompeii, the archaeological site, into the film. So if you don't already know, essentially when in the film they're doing these swooping kind of overhead shots of the city, how they did those were through drone footage of the actual archaeological site. And then on top of that, they then CGI'd it to look, obviously, as it did before the eruption. And I just really appreciated that attention to detail and at least trying to link it with the physical reality of the site. And when they showed the main character's house in terms of how um, the house was decorated with the wall paintings and it, you know, it had a little Loraria shrine. And I thought the kind of physical layout of the city, the way it was depicted was done very well. And I really appreciated that they had utilized that drone footage from the real site and then kind of mapped on top of that so it, it at least gave that the material feeling of the city I thought out of many of the films of the ancient world because it utilized that connection with the real site I think it did a really great job of that so that's something that's something that I really enjoyed but as you said there's not many <laughs> films that that show the kind of everyday life, I suppose, that, that gardens would maybe fall under. Obviously, there's HBO's Rome series, which I haven't actually watched in a while, and I should maybe go back and look through some of the episodes and see how they are depicting the domestic settings and have a look at the gardens. I hadn't actually thought to do that. So, but other than that Rome series, Pompeii, there's the films tend to focus much more, there's a lot more mythology content and, and you know, epic Greek history. I suppose Spartacus, uh, I, again, I could look at the domestic aspect of that. But, but yeah, in my film class, lots of, lots of, Rome, uh, lots of Greek myth content in, in that, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting, yeah. I mean, Rome is kind of the only one we really have that shows and devotes enough time to the domestic side because they can yeah because gladiator is obviously a really well-known roman film but it's so focused on the public spectacle and the only domestic settings we really see in in detail are the imperial palace so and it's very much the interior 
of that palace. I can't think of so-called exterior shots of Rome. One thing that really annoys me about that film, when they're coming in from defeating the, who's coming in? Um, Yakim Phoenix's Domitian, that's it. I couldn't think of the Empress name. He's riding into Rome all triumphant and everything is so white that it's like gleaming. There's not a, there's not a, there's not a fleck of color anywhere. Um, <laughs> obviously, you know, color in Roman sculpture has been heavily discussed of recent times. And that is not a good representation of color in the ancient world in that I am sure that there were buildings that were just plain white marble and aspects would not have been painted, but it always shocks me when I go back to that film, that entrance scene, Oh, it's not Domitian, it's Commodus, sorry. When Commodus is coming in on his chariot and he's meeting the senators on the steps and just everything is so white. And yeah, I just think it looks very boring because it's just like, <laughs> it's like this kind of off-white grey overshot of the city. And I just think that's why I like Pompeii, the film, because it shows the colour, it, it shows the graffiti on the walls, it shows that things are dirty and there's grime and there's grit and there's a reality to it that I, I do appreciate. But in, in general terms, you know, I have a lot, a lot to say about depictions of the ancient world <laughs> of film, as I have taught a whole course on it. Some, some good, some not so good, some very problematic. <laughs> I, I love how you're not like a specialist in material culture and yet you're observing and you're you're looking at Rome because when I watch the exact same scene, I don't really think at all about the colors. What I think is when I see the procession, I just sit yes. there and, I'm, and I and I think that's Roman fascism right there. <laughs> fascism. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah. There's a lot to unpack actually in that in that scene from from many angles. But yes, I it's interesting, as you said, I'm not an archaeologist and I very much I, I think I would still class myself my basis. I've come from a literary perspective, but increasingly I'm bringing in material culture and originally my PhD thesis, all of my examples were going to be literary examples. And then the more I was just doing my basic research, I just thought I can't not talk, like there's so many amazing pieces of art that show flowers and plants. And there's all of these, you know, real physical gardens that we have from Pompeii. And so the art history side of my personality, I mean, it really got a crash course in art history during my PhD. And, and, and so now I think it's nice because when I may be getting frustrated with literature, I can switch to thinking more about the material culture and, and vice versa. So I, I really like that combination of different bits of evidence because I think that's one of the strengths of classics as a subject in that it's, it, it's inherently multidisciplinary or I think it should be inherently interdisciplinary in that even when we think of ourselves as oh I'm more of a literary person or a material culture mm -hmm. we all deal with all of the evidence in yeah. some way and I think it does a disservice if we don't um, and I, I really did see this when I was thinking about the framework of my PhD that if I if I limited to just the literary examples, then yes, I'd still be having an interesting conversation, but it would be limiting in some ways because it would be dealing purely with one type of media when clearly, when we look at the Roman evidence, all of these different pieces of media, they are working with each other. So we should also think about them together. We shouldn't separate them out into our little sub subtopics it's interesting and and since you know there's not a lot that does things with gardens I, I don't know I I guess it just popped into my mind I was like it would be cool wouldn't it if someone just like I don't know played the sims and then just created like a little mini Rome or whatever but then you just you spent hours creating like the perfect garden I don't know about you but I played the sims so much and I just created custom houses <laughs> and gardens for hours and then I was way more interested like invested in that than playing the game yeah I know there have been examples of like virtual reality where they have reconstructed particular houses in Pompeii and they have reconstructed like the gardens as part of that only a few examples where they've done like the entire house so I think it would be cool if we could have 
more of that and to kind of utilize virtual reality to get that experience of actually walking through the space as well. And that's one of the things that's so great, obviously, about Pompeii that we have and the Vesuvian region more generally. When I'm thinking about space, the fact that I can actually go to the spaces and walk through them when you're thinking, when I'm thinking about paintings in particular, yes, you can think about them, you know, they're painted on a two dimensional wall surface. But in order to fully appreciate how the Romans experienced them, you want to experience them as part of a three dimensional space, you know, how do you approach them? Do you do you see it head on? Are you coming like round a corner? And is it a surprise? Can can you see all of it at once? Is it is it going to be hidden at certain times of day? And I think, that's why it's so great when we leave the paintings in situ and not pains me when I see like bits of a fresco that have just been pulled out and now they're in a museum somewhere um, because originally that's what they did. They'd like cut out the interesting bit and, and move it to a museum. Luckily, no one thought that the garden paintings were the interesting bits for me. So they've left them, they've left them all, they've left them all there in Pompeii for me. So um, again, that probably tells us something about our more modern concern with what's quote unquote real art and what's the ornamental surround. Mm -hmm. No, I was just thinking, so we have like, yeah, we have a, a billion like rom-coms and, and, and other movies and stuff. And so I'm like, you know, I wish someone would just like make something and call it like a Roman garden party or it, it just like, <laughs> like, you know, just set it all in gardens. Um, I'm thinking of like, there's this one adaptation of, what was it? I think it was like 12th night, I want to say with the Helena Bonham Carter in it. Oh, I haven't seen that. Yeah, it's, it's, it was made in like 1989 or 1990 or so, something like that. But yeah, she's brilliant in it. But many of the scenes they take place in Countess Olivia's garden. And so you have these oh, great scenes of them like walking around in this garden and, you know, they take a stroll and she's like, and, and I think it's like they have some of the, the most poignant scenes set in a garden. So you have like, yeah. you know, where she confesses her love for Cesario first in the garden. And then you have the mix up happen in the garden. And then you have the big reveal in the garden. So I was like, can someone just do that? But like call it a Roman garden party and yeah, do it you see, ancient Rome. Um, when we, when we look at, you know, pieces of literature, that, that's kind of comparison, I suppose, to some of the ways in which we see gardens in Roman literature. They're kind of the, the setting for some interesting events. <laughs> so they can be a kind of backdrop to a series of things, but it's, it is interesting when, you know, why the garden? Why do they always occur in these places, these interesting Again, you could think about kind of boundary crossing. Sometimes there are these like illicit encounters in the garden. It's because, you know, you've already you've already crossed a boundary to kind of come into the garden space. So then it's like, oh, does anything go when we're in here? So, <laughs> Yeah, I just I'd like to see that. I have to rewatch that movie because I haven't seen it in a while. But yeah, there, I'm probably missing something. But yeah, no, I just what, <laughs> what I remember. It was really great. Sort of to wrap up the interview portion, I have I usually end with three questions. First one is when you were either an undergrad or you can you know you can also use your grad school period. Did you go to office hours? So I was thinking about this and trying to remember whether I did as an undergrad. And I do remember going to meetings that weren't specifically related to a paper or something like that. But I think in my undergraduate system, we essentially had a professor within the department that was your kind of point of contact for pastoral care. And I think they wanted you to come and visit them maybe once a semester and they try and arrange that meeting with you. And I, I do remember going to some of those. Whether or not I took the initiative to ever go, I don't maybe think I did. But the fact that there was that formal system, I suppose I did benefit from a form of office hours. I definitely utilized, you know, a form of office hours going through graduate school. I think maybe you just become more comfortable with the faculty. You're not so scared and you genuinely have questions that you think, if I don't ask someone, then, you know, this is going to cost me my degree. Whereas as an undergraduate, there's always this sense of, well, I'll figure it out. I'll ask someone. Whereas 
the further you go into your graduate school degree, the more it becomes clear that you really do need to ask your professor questions quite a lot of the time. Um, so, so yes, I definitely see a correlation between the further into my education I got, the more I utilized an office hour of some, some variety. Yeah. Okay. Did you have maybe a favorite memory from, you know, like a conversation, a certain thing that happened within an office hour setting? I think, I think my, my favorite kind of memory, I suppose, or just fun fact about my office hours experience is the physical office of my PhD primary supervisor, William Fitzgerald. Uh, I believe he's now moved offices, but at the time he was my supervisor at King's College London. He was in what I think is considered the, the prime office of the department in that it's, you know, really, really big. It's got these huge windows that look out onto the Strand in London. We would also have classes during my MA in his office because it had, you know, space for a big table. So when there's only three or four of us, we were actually in his office and then he became my PhD supervisor. So I felt like I spent a lot of time in that office, but it was also being in an old London building, this kind of funny, funny bit of the department that essentially it was a staircase that led to nowhere other than his office. <laughs> um, so you would go up the staircase and you would reach his office. There were also stairs that when you kind of entered this tower, they appeared to lead down, but if you walked all the way down, you would just come to a dead end. So there was nothing there. And for ages, I thought, what on earth is this like staircase to nothing that goes down? Like the only reason you would essentially access this staircase now is to get to this specific office. And it turns out that the staircase the, that went down underground originally connected to the London tube system. There used to be a tube station on the Strand. It's now um, abandoned. It's now used for like filming, fil like James Bond, when they film a tube station scene, it's filmed in the Strand because it's no longer a functional tube station and the classics department used to have its own entrance into the strand <laughs> tube station and so I found out after many years of wondering what's going on here that that little staircase it used to be a private little entrance to the strand tube station for via the classics department at King's College London so I that's my I suppose that's my fond memory of that room. And I associate that with <laughs> I see my supervisor, but I'm always like, that is such a <laughs> British story that would only happen. It would only happen in an old, in an old British building. So yeah, I have fond memories of the room, I think. And <laughs> because of that, yeah. <laughs> That's a pretty special one. That's yeah. a definitely a special <laughs> one. So, and and now as an educator yourself, you know, and, and you've seen the other side of it as, yeah. the, you know, professor who's trying to teach, you know, these youngins, <laughs> you know, if you had to make small case for why you should attend office hours, you know, what would you say? I think it's just a great way, one, to get to know your professor and introduce yourself as well. I mean, I'm at a university now where I teach really, really large classes up to I think my largest class is nine was 90 people so it's you know it's very hard other than if you've got you know a few individuals that constantly sit in the first couple of rows it's very hard to even have facial recognition of 90 members of any class particularly if you're teaching four classes at a time as I have on occasion and so having that personal connection and being able to for me and for them be able to connect that kind of face and name and, and establish um, a personal bond. Because I think for me, it just helps me so much to be able to help my students if I know them and they're not just a name on a piece of paper um, to establish that connection. So I think getting that name recognition, especially if you're in a large class, like it's so worth it if you're a student because I am going to remember the people that come to my office hours. If there's only 10 people that come out of, you know, 150, I'm going to have an easier time just by logic of remembering those people. So I think that's good. And I think especially if you're 
you know, concerned about something or you're, you have questions that aren't directly linked to the class, I think it's just a great way for a student to be able to maybe hash out certain ideas, you know, if they're thinking about taking classics as a major or they're concerned about something. I very much have an open door policy. I always encourage students to come to my office hours, whether or not they do, but I think it's just a really great tool for a more informal type of conversation and a more personal one. And those two things, I suppose, go hand in hand. You know, I don't think I'm a particularly scary person standing at the front of class. You know, some people may think I am, but I think it, if you visit office hours, it may be humanizes your professor to some extent that you're no longer just this person standing at the front of a room I'm actually a human being that you can have a conversation with and I think once you break that ice and that initial conversation then it becomes so much easier for the relationship to develop and I think those relationships particularly if you're thinking about going on to future school whether it be graduate school in classics or something else having those relationships with your professors is so important you know just at a practical level for writing references I would like to know who I'm right I, can, <laughs> I can't write the best effective reference if I don't really know who you are so yeah I think come to office hours to see that we professors are human beings we're not just these scary people that stand <laughs> at the front of class and talk about their, their <laughs> like for Aeneas and their love for Augustus so so yes uh, I think it's a very humanizing interaction and maybe makes academia a less scary place I think is why why I would advise people to go go see their professors and sometimes some professors are really cool and have cool things my favorite professor had a chocolate drawer Yes. So I, I personally did not have a chocolate drawer, but that was more because I, in this current position, unfortunately, as an adjunct faculty member, I don't have a permanent office, so I couldn't really create one. But my, my colleague, uh, Melissa Funky, she has like a, an owl kind of biscuit like type jar thing and she has various treats in there and so I know that she follows that and I think I always say to her when I have my first permanent office I too am going to have a treat drawer but you should also always have tissues in your office because there will undoubtedly be some crying sessions either from me myself or the <laughs> students so it's always good to have always good to have tissues on hand I think so no I definitely utilized my professor's tissues I think yeah. I <laughs> run out of tissues at one point because yeah. I had you know the existential job crisis and everything else so I was like oh. yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's just, so yeah, chocolate and tissues, mm -hmm. it's always going to be a winning combination for, for a professor to have those two things at their disposal in their office at all times. Or they just have really cool tchotchkes that you can ask them about. And then, you know, if you get lucky, something good might happen. I remember, I mean, absolute favorite professor. She was uh, on the older side and I remember she retired like the year after I left, after I graduated. And so when she had to empty out her office, she had like a bunch of the animated Hercules like characters oh, very cool. yeah. and so when she retired she reached out to me and just said hey I know you really loved my big <laughs> Cyclops Titan I need to get rid of it would you like it and I was like yes I want him so, so I nice I I have a few Roman soldier Lego kind of things and I also have some of the Playmobil Greek gods and goddesses that currently are on my bookshelf at home. But I feel like when I have my permanent office, then I will transport those because I, I think they'll be a good addition to any office and they'll they'll create a nice office hours. Yeah. I love classics professor offices. They're so chill and they have all these weird tchotchkes and other cool books that you just, yeah, you know, you could share their books. They, based on what I have surrounding me at my home office, when I <laughs> transport that to a real office, I will be one of those professors that has lots of weird and wonderful little trinkets on the side that people will think, why has <laughs> she got this? <laughs> and it'll be a conversation starter. So that would be good. Oh, that's wonderful. So the last thing I have every guest do is read Percy Shelley's wonderful poem, Ozymandias. And once you've read it, you know, you don't, it doesn't have to be the longest thing you've, you know, ever analyzed. This is just meant to be something fun. But, you know, if you could just give us your like quick thoughts and like, you know, meaning of this poem, you know, why do we think it's so powerful? Is it so powerful? Actually, any thoughts you have, they would be much appreciated. Okay, so 
Okay, so I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor, well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on those lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Nothing besides remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. I've, I don't think I've ever read a poem out loud like that before. So I hope I did it justice. Yes. I mean, it's hard to ruin a good poem, so. Oh, but that's true, yes. What I thought of this, it really brought to mind, actually, something that is very local to me right now. I am teaching currently at the University of Winnipeg. I finish imminently before I move on to my next position. Reading this poem made me rethink these issues of kind of monumentality and statues and statues coming down as well. And that's obviously been in the news a lot recently. And we have an example of that wider conversation that occurred actually in Winnipeg. So for your listeners that do not know of this story, essentially last year on Canada Day, outside of the Manitoba legislature in Winnipeg, there's a big Queen Victoria statue. And on Canada Day, the Victoria part of the statue was taken down. It was basically pulled off of the pedestal. And what remains now is the original pedestal. And the pedestal is covered with painted handprints, orange handprints. And this is connected to the discovery of unmarked graves of indigenous children in previous residential school sites in Canada and so the the handprints are a mark a symbol of the children that were left behind and also found in these unmarked graves so when I was reading the poem it really brought me back to all of those events and this idea of fragmentary remains in particular because actually only last week in the news they made the decision, there's obviously been a big public inquiry after this statue came down, you know, what to do. And basically they decided that the Victoria bit of the Queen Victoria statue was, it's been damaged too much to repair so that you would replace it. So essentially, we still don't know what's going to happen to this fragment of Queen Victoria, but it's never, they now know it's not gonna be put back on the pedestal because it's too expensive to repair. So what is left, is now the pedestal that says Queen Victoria and the dates and these painted orange handprints. And for me personally, I think that is a much more powerful monument than the original one. When people ask me what I think about the, this monument, I, I saw it the following day when it had been toppled over and it was the Victoria bit was still lying there. And I thought about this, that I honestly walk past the legislature pretty much every day. And I had not really given this statue a second thought in its original form. If someone had asked me where it was or if it existed, I, I probably wouldn't have known. That, that's how little I thought about it. And I compare that to now, when I pass it, I always think about it. I, I always spot it, I always notice it. It always makes me think and reflect. And so this forms part of this big wider conversation about what happens when a monument is quote unquote destroyed or it gets damaged, what's left behind, how does that tell us about history and historical conversations. And so, yeah, when I read this poem and the, the kind of power of what was left behind in the poem and how that's still powerful, it just made me think of what we have here in Winnipeg and what has still been left behind. And People want to criticize that. But for me personally, I found the fragment of the original more powerful and more thought provoking and more provocative than than the original. So that uh, is not really much to do with with Ozymandias. But when, when I read that poem, it just really brought home those conversations that have been happening in, in the broader world and, and specifically in Winnipeg that we've had this example right here, literally, you know, three blocks down the street from where I live 
Um, and so, yeah, it just kind of brought all that back home to me and made me think about, yeah, the power of monuments, but also the power of the fragments of what is left behind of monuments and how, how those fragments can continue a conversation or shift a conversation in a different way, I think. No, I love that. I love it because it connects the ancient to the modern, which is, you know, kind of purpose, the overarching goal that I hope to do. So no, that's, that's wonderful. I love that. What I will say is that this is my favorite poem of all time. I have yet <laughs> to find one I love more. To me, it's, it's a political statement by Shelley on the ephemeral nature of political power. And, you know, I alone can do this. I alone can rule and fix it and whatever. And you're like, ah, so funny. And so, yeah, it's this kind of just constant memento mori, right? Like you will die and then you will be forgotten because this king thought he would, his civilization would reign forever. And then, well, it's just. Yeah. And actually the, the kind of second thing that reading it made me think of like connecting it specifically to classics it really made me think of that passage in Lucan where Caesar is walking through the ruins of Troy and like he doesn't actually realize that he's walking through he has to be told because it's like all in ruins but then once he realizes suddenly it's very important to him and he wants to make all of these connections and he's like I will refound a new Troy and all of this stuff but it's interesting that he had to be reminded of where he was um, to begin with. So it also made me think of that passage in, in Luke and that they were my two, the two things that it made me think of this passage. Yeah. So kind of just like considering all that, then uh, the last question I ask every single guest, because I'm endlessly curious and I kind of <laughs> love all the different answers I get is if we consider like our modern society today, do we have a modern Ozymandias, something that we think is like so great and amazing and then realistically I used to say a thousand years but honestly I've been going with like 200 because you know like <laughs> global warming could kill us all so yeah. we're probably not going to make it a thousand so like two thousand you know 200 years like is it still going to be great or well I think to to be honest I think again I, I'm going to bring it back to my local example of the, of the Manitoba legislature, that not just this statue of Queen Victoria, but part of the Manitoba legislature it has a huge frieze that evokes classical imagery as part of its kind of colonial message. And in terms of that kind of colonial, the connection, I suppose, between kind of colonial power and also the Greek and Roman world, I think that that tie was held up as a great thing that is why it's on so many buildings and I think that is an example of something that has had this moment already or is going through that moment because it was this connection and this use of classical imagery to promote a way of thinking that at the, was seen as the greatness of you know white western civilization that's been held up for so long and it's only now that we're starting to have that conversation about what it means when we maybe unravel that. So I almost see the way that society is grappling with monumentality at the moment as we're almost in the middle of that journey, I suppose, between we had these things that were all considered great and good monuments we are trying to figure out what they mean for us now and what to do with it. And we, we don't have all of the solutions yet. So I don't, I don't know what the end is going to look like. We are clearly on a journey of discovery, I think. So I just think in terms of the modern, do we have an Ozymandias in the modern world? I almost think that we as a society, it's going to sound very profound. Um, I think almost we as a society, we, we're going through that process towards monumentality in general, because I think, I can't think of another time when we were having so many conversations about monuments and what they mean and what they could mean or should mean as we are now. So I think that that's why maybe this poem can strike such a chord and, and, and made me think so much of these examples that are right here, right now that we're living through, because maybe one day we'll have our Ozymandias kind of outcome. But I, I, I don't know what that will look like yet, I think. No, that's a great answer. Very different from the others I've had, which is great because it gives me, you know, more, <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 variety. But no, 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 it's fantastic. So the last thing I want to ask is where can people find you? 
Yeah, so I am on Twitter. That's where I am the most, if not too much. It's um, at Vicky, spelled V-I-C-K-Y, and then underscore Austin, A-U-S-T-E-N. That's where you can find me the most. I am also in the process of transitioning basically between two positions. So I'm currently at the University of Winnipeg, but from the fall, I'll be at Carleton College in Minnesota. So I'm going just a little bit south uh, and I'll be there for the next two years. So yeah, you can find me, I suppose, on those faculty faculty pages. Uh, but yeah, Twitter, Twitter is the best place to find me. <laughs> I think that's true for most classes. Yes, all on classics think, Twitter. We, we are a we are a very on Twitter mm-hmm. discipline. I think <laughs> <laughs> for better or for worse. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but oh no, it was so lovely to have you on. There was so much we didn't get to cover. Obviously, we can't cover like, everything. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, thank, you, thank you so much for inviting me on. And this was this was great. I got to think about a lot of things that. I'm always thinking about, but I don't necessarily get to have a formal conversation about them. So thank you very much. Yeah, well, we I, I hope we can have you on at some future interval. Would love to have you back. And congratulations on the new position. Thank you. I'm sure you're thrilled about moving to the US. <laughs> well, I, I'm excited to have a more permanent contract. Uh, and it's going to be a very great position, position, more research. So I'll actually have time to do research, paid time to do research. This is very exciting. <laughs> um, and, and still do some teaching as well. So it's going to be really, really nice. Uh, shift of gears uh, but yeah bittersweet when you you have to leave somewhere that you've been for three years but yeah excited excited about the opportunities for the new position definitely great well we'll definitely have to check in once uh once you've made the move yes <laughs> trireme transit is now departing ancient office hours next stop is present ponderings